Good afternoon and welcome to this online meeting organised by ISAG, the Independent Scientific Advisory Group on COVID-19 in Ireland. Our usual host, Aoife McLeisick, can chair the meeting today, so I've been asked to step in, uh, which is a pleasure to do, of course. It's been plenty to there's been plenty to talk about this week, including in the Republic of Ireland, the Minister of Health, Stephen Donnelly, announced that the Department of Health and the Irish Medical Organisation had reached agreement about the future of public health medicine in Ireland. This agreement, if approved, will give Ireland's senior public health doctors the professional status they deserve and provides a structure for the future operation of public health in the country. The resolution of the issues is a tribute to the excellent work of public health doctors during the pandemic, has been, as has been highlighted repeatedly by ISAG, and it brings Ireland into line with international standards of public health practice. The agreement was 20 years in the making, there was another example this week of the slow pace at which things can sometimes move on this Ireland of ours. In Northern Ireland on Monday, on the 19th of April, 2021, the testing of close contacts of people who have tested positive for COVID-19 commenced for the first time. This testing of high risk contacts was first called for by the Director General of the World Health Organization on the 16th of March last year and was promised by the Northern Ireland Assembly Executive in their COVID strategy published on the 12th of May last year. Internationally, the total of COVID-19 deaths passed 3 million. It should be a sobering moment for the world. The phrase, you're not safe until we're all safe, has never had more cogency than it has at the moment. And this last week, the issue of availability of effective vaccine worldwide has come to the fore. At the end of last week, former heads of state and Nobel laureates called on President Biden to waive the intellectual property rules for COVID vaccines. The letter was coordinated by the People's Vaccine Alliance, a coalition of more than 50 organizations. And amongst those 170 signatories was former Irish president, Mary Robinson, former prime minister of the UK, Gordon Brown, and Mikhail Gorbachev, the former president of the Soviet Union. And we will today be dealing predominantly about the international situation with COVID-19 which is in a very perilous and difficult state, with our two distinguished guests, Thomas Mellon and Eric Feigl-Ding. But before that, we have our regular ISAG data update, which today is by James Merrick. Over to you, James. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Um, so, did we have a card yet? Um, the high-level picture this week in terms of the numbers about virus incidents on the island is it probably it's going to be a short story today in the sense that it's, it's a continuation of the, of the trend we, we saw last week um so if we could bring up the slides please ben great and um, we can go to the, and just thanks to uh, paul and, and collaborators to, to make this rolling analysis possible so if we go to the first slide please and we'll start again with northern ireland um so this again is um, the average daily cases per 100,000 people. Um, the y-axis is a logarithmic scale. And we, 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 we use the logarithmic scale to show trends. So, so, so as we discussed last week, mentioned last week, there was some issues around testing around Easter. And we, that's the sort of reason for this kind of discontinuity um, around early April. But there's a general broad trend in the north of um, continuing shift um, to, to lower case numbers on the right. And as we know, you know, the vaccination program continues at pace across the United Kingdom. Um, so again, it's, it's a sort of a continuation of, of the story of, of, that, of the last couple of weeks in the North. Um, if we go to the next slide, please, Ben. Yeah, so in the Republic, um, again, we, we have this little breakout. Um, the blue line is healthcare workers and, and the yellow line is the vast majority of the population, non-healthcare workers. Um, and, and with the healthcare workers largely vaccinated, we, we see this lower, lower incidence of, of the virus. Um, among the, you know, the rest of the population, we see this continuation of the, of the slow decline that started over the Easter break um, there have been a few signals that there might be some push um, on case numbers again um, in terms of GP reference data, but it's, it's too early to say. Um, of course, the big concern um, when, when school is, is schools and with, with the 
rising cases on children when schools open before Easter. Um, you know, if that's to be repeated, that'll start showing up um, in the next few days and beyond. So we'll, we'll be keeping an eye on that. Um, so, so the kind of situ the virus incidents, viral incident, COVID, SARS-CoV-2 in Ireland, it, it's sort of a, a similar similar pattern as we discussed last week. Um, internationally, we're going to talk about in the webinar. Just there's a lot of stories internationally. And um, just a final slide, please, Ben. Given the topic of today's uh, webinar, is the, is the next slide is just about um, the Neffet briefing the other evening uh, mentioned the uh, what we've known for you know since since January that B117 is now dominant on the island, um, and, and we 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 we've documented cases of of local transmission of of. Um, cases not associated with travel of B1351, P1, B16, B1617, all associated with, um, we'll say, kind of bad, bad situations internationally. Um, so that's that's the that's the um, that's the that's the, yeah that's the broad update. So so um, up with that, I'll uh, pass it on. So thank you. Thanks very much for that, James. Thank you indeed. Um, so for the rest of the meeting, we're going to be dealing with the international situation. And uh, we've got two distinguished speakers and we'll hear from both of them and we'll discuss with them uh, in some individual issues arising from, from their work and their, and their contributions. And then it's very much open for questions and answers uh, from members of the panel, the ISAG panel here, uh, from our speakers and uh, hopefully questions from some of the people who are uh, listening in. Um, so, uh, can I first of all welcome Thomas Mallon. Thomas, uh, from, I, I presume, Thomas, you're speaking to us from London. Uh, Thomas works at UCL, University, uh, sorry, Imperial College London. How dare I say UCL to someone yeah. working in Imperial That's a terrible thing to do. Yeah. Uh, it's because I, I, I know a lot of uh, people on independent stage from UCL. Um, uh, Thomas from uh, Imperial, and uh, Thomas is... Um, uh, I think your most important contribution, the one we're particularly interested in, uh, Thomas, is the work you've been doing on variants and, and in particular what's happening in, in Latin America with the Brazilian variant. Can I hand over to you to just talk about that whole issue and some of your findings of, of the work you've done with uh, Brazilian colleagues? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, thanks very much for the introduction there, uh, Gabriel. Uh, yes, I work at Imperial College, as you say, in the Department of Infectious Disease Epidemiology. And I've been looking at Brazil really uh, since March of last year, but in particular focusing on the variants since about November. So, I mean, I, I want to use this opportunity to, to say a couple of things. One of them will be more kind of summary, some technical, quite important and extremely uh, relevant points to Ireland about P1, about uh, its, its uh, altered, epidemi uh, altered epidemiological characteristics. Um, and uh, as well as briefly mentioning that, I'd, I'd like to make a few points uh, that are more sort of general opinion based about how we might, how we might deal with these uh, variants going forwards. So about P1, I mean, P1 uh, 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 arose in Manaus in, we, we estimate in November of last year. So Manaus is interesting for a number of reasons. It, it was interesting because in April, May, March of last year, we anecdotally, there was very high levels of infection and they were hit very badly uh, in the whole Amazonas, but particularly in Manaus. Um, Later, this was confirmed by serological studies that looked at the number of acts in blood donors, and they came up with a very high figure for the number of people who've been infected, around three quarters. So this is completely, um, this is this is very unusual, and it suggests essentially an unmitigated, almost uh, epidemic in Manaus. So we were really looking at Manaus quite carefully, and then around November of of last year, we started to see very slowly the, the cases and infections started to increase. Now this, this is quite unusual and uh, I mean there's some kind of must be some kind of inconsistency here because if we're at such a high level of cases how can the infections be increasing? So 
the team, uh, I mean, as part of a big collaboration between different groups uh, in the UK and uh, and in Brazil, uh, we started looking at genomic sampling. So there hadn't been much genome sequencing at all in Manaus, but we started looking at genome sequencing in, in Manaus. Uh, and pretty much through December, and the start of no yeah through december and the start of november we've seen the complete fixation of um of p1 over prior circulating strains so within the course of a number of weeks it went from zero percent the uh, the identification of this new lineage p1 it went from zero percent to effectively 100 percent and this was correlated with uh, a very high rise in cases and indeed in deaths uh, as confirmed in ex uh, as confirmed through excess mortality records and through hospital records um, in Manaus. So we were able to look at this situation and we were able to com combine our phylo phylogenetic analysis, looking at the family tree of, of the P1 uh, strain, that uh, variant rather, that had uh, arisen in Manaus, and we were able to track back it, the time of its most recent common ancestor. And we were able to use this data combined with multiple streams of uh, epi epidemiological lineless data, so hospital records and excess deaths to attempt to characterize the, the um, epidemiological properties of this P1 variant that seemed to be causing such a large second wave in Manaus, despite, despite the fact that there had already been a, a large first wave. And what we find whenever we used our uh, epidemiological model, which uh, I'll not go too much into the technical details, but what we found when we looked at this was that uh, P1 was substantially, uh, it had substantial increases in terms of its transmissibility. So it's between somewhere between 1.7 and 2.4 times more transmissible. But as well as this, we find that it is able to evade uh, cross immunity to some degree with respect to the immunity elicited from prior infection with other strains. So we're, we're estimating maybe about a 25% evasion of the protective immunity that one might acquire from a, from a prior infection. And uh, the, the third notable thing about the altered epidemiological characteristics of P1 uh, that we found was that there was quite a substantial Ele elevated risk um, of, of mortality associated with P1. So, I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty about this, but we find that it's somewhere between 1.2 and 1.9 times increased risk of mortality. This, of course, comes with some caveats in that we wouldn't necessarily expect to see exactly the same things as we've seen in Manaus in other places because you know, Manaus, as as was widely reported, there was uh, there was uh, hospital failure, so it's difficult to. Uh, I mean, there was failure in the sense that they run out of oxygen, so there was lots of people dying, perhaps unnecessarily, and it's difficult to separate this out from the you know the in intrinsic risk of mortality of the disease from what could be avoided through reasonable clinical practices. So, I mean, there are some caveats in the results that we've given. Uh, but I think these are still quite notable and we still have to be extremely cautious, especially whenever we're seeing quite a high number of P1 cases in, in, uh, in our Ireland now that have been reported uh, quite recently. Uh, so as well as those technical points, I, I just wanted to mix a couple of uh, general, general points uh, if, if I have time, but please inter interrupt me if I'm going on too much, Gabriel. Uh, so one thing I would just like to say is that I think we need to deal with these variants. I think we need to have a very high level of testing and that needs to be free, rapid, uh, rapidly available home testing, and it needs to be complemented with random testing, and uh, uh, systematic random testing at a very high level, as well as having a very high level of genomic sequences because it's not really good enough to pick up these variants if you're only genotyping or full genome sequencing, a small percentage you really need to be having a high level to get on top of it, I think. But as well as the high level of testing, I think this needs to be combined with supporting people who are testing positive. So they need to have, you know, it's no good somebody testing positive and being told to isolate for two weeks if they can't, uh, if they can't afford not to work and they've got a bunch of kids at home and so forth. Um, uh, another kind of general point is that we, we we shouldn't be fearful of the variants as such, 
but we do need to be, I mean, extremely uh, cautious. Um, so, I mean, we, we know what MPIs work, um, but uh, just we need to be very cautious in releasing these MPI, uh, sorry, non-pharmaceutical interventions, so things like uh, physical distancing and, and lockdowns. We need to be very careful and slow uh, in terms of releasing these. Um, and, and one kind of large point I'd just like to make very quickly as well, if that's okay, is that I think we really do need to have some kind of universal vaccine availability. And that's going to be key to stopping the variants. So although the levels of vaccination are reasonable in the UK and they're not too bad in Ireland, uh, and they're very good in Israel. In, in many places, uh, they're extremely low, like off the charts low, effectively zero. And this is absolutely critical. I mean, we've seen two of the variants of concern, the South African variant and the Brazil variant, arise in low and middle income countries. And there's no reason to think why this is not going to continue. So uh, with high levels of you know, virus circulating in other countries. Um, Perhaps one final point is, yeah, <laughs> okay. No, I mean, I was just going to say that, you know, there, there is a cause for optimism uh, from standing start for 15 months. We vastly increased our knowledge of COVID-19 and broadly speaking, many of the things that we now understand, whether it's the non-pharmaceutical interventions or the vaccines, broadly speaking, they will uh, work for the variants. So there is cause for optimism. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Thomas, and thanks for your contribution to the knowledge because your paper about uh, maths and science was was uh, a landmark paper, I think, in the in the pandemic. Uh, one of the, if I could just ask a couple of questions before we move on. Uh, one is about um, uh, we heard a lot about that high level of first wave infection in Manos, and uh, I think you mentioned it was estimated to be up to seventy five percent. Now a lot of the people who had been promoting the population immunity, herd immunity type of uh, argument, uh, we're, we're saying, well, that's more or less what you need for herd immunity. And it turned out not to be right, but uh, for Manaus and for Amazonia. But t tell me this, uh, how mm -hmm. confident would you be in that estimate of the three quarters? Because I think if I remember correctly from the original paper, it was to do with uh, uh, blood donations or, or, or some other testing, which may or may not have been yes. uh, population based. Yeah. Yeah. So that figure of three quarters was quite controversial at the time. Um, and it, it was controversial because it's very important for understanding the dynamics of the disease. Um, and as you say, uh, it, it's, it's very difficult to get a, a representative sample uh, of of uh, antibodies from a sero survey in the north of brazil so this is convenience samples from uh from from blood donors uh, so so the question is i mean is that number of three quarters right a three quarters attack rate three quarters of people have been infected surely a more parsimonious situation is just that it's simply an, an error but since then there have been a number of streams of evidence that have kind of quite strongly supported that Secondly, there was uh, independent estimates from our own work on P1, where we independently verified uh, or estimated what the attack rate was, not using anti uh, you know that that blood donor survey at all. And another stream of evidence is uh, a, a representative survey survey that was done in Maranao, and it found not quite as high levels of antibodies in people, but it did find high levels around forty percent. But the number of people who died in that wave was much smaller than in Manaus. So it does suggest that the 75% figure in Manaus is correct. Um, and finally, I would say that I guess um, there, there, there was a long period of quiescence uh, between April and May, whenever there was very little reinfection, which does suggest a high level of population immunity. I'm not sure I call it herd immunity as such, but it does suggest that there was a high level of immunity until that waned, or there was some kind of immune escape, and we've seen, as we've seen with the variant P1 come along. Okay, yeah. thanks. Uh, well, one more question. I, I, I mean, I think, am I right in thinking that that, uh, that variant is one of mm -hmm. the, the reasons why Chile is having such a difficult time at the moment, that that's, that spread um, of the P1? And uh, you've, uh, I'm sure you've been following it spread across the world. And what does this tell us? Do you think it's really necessary to stop these variants? Are there key features you want to quickly identify for us? 
Yeah, so, I mean, you, you're absolutely right. We have seen P1 spread out essentially uh, you know, uh, from all of the, pl pl I mean, the, the north of Brazil, Manaus and Amazonas is not particularly well connected, but and yet we've seen P1 spread out across all of the states of Brazil and across uh, Latin America as well. The extent to which it spread is, is actually very difficult to identify because the level of genomic characterization is is extremely poor in many places. So we just, we, we, we don't know. But in, in other places that have a reasonable level of genomic surveillance in Latin America, for example, we are, we're uh, Grande do Sol state, quite far away from Amazonas in the south of Brazil. Uh, there, the, the genomic sampling is reasonable and we've seen fixation. Uh, so the P1 becoming dominant overall, although there are circulating strains in that state. Um, Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Thomas. Uh, you're staying with us and, and we'll come back to you. Yeah. Uh, for, and, and, and don't be afraid to, to intervene. Uh, I will do. Thanks, thanks very much. Good. Uh, and thank you very much for that. It's great to hear from you. And again, congratulations on a, a stunningly good bit of work. Um, can, can I now turn to our second guest, uh, Eric Feigolding? Um, uh, for those of you on social media following COVID 19 on social media, Eric probably doesn't need any. Uh, introduction because he's been one of the most fantastic voices uh, uh, talking you know in in, in such uh, concise and well expressed terms about the whole epidemic right almost in fact Eric right from the very beginning of it you've been a very active presence which must come at some personal cost I'm sure because it's not always for everyone a comfortable place to to be but you, from, a, from a public health point of view, I certainly appreciate your, your commentary. Um, uh, Eric, would you like to talk from uh, your perspective as a, a US-based US public health professional working in this whole arena and trying to communicate the ideas about uh, international spread and, and, and the problems of international spread and, and the way in which we're treating the virus around the world? Would you like to talk to us for a while about that and, and have a discussion with us? Go ahead. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. And it's been a very long 15 months now since the pandemic started. And I cannot emphasize how tired everyone is. And what I really want to focus on right now is that uh, the variants are. Eric, Eric, can you just hold on a second? I, we're, I think we're having some difficulty with your, uh, your, your, your okay. voice stream. Here, um, can, can maybe, I, maybe you could. Uh, I, I, I don't know whether you should be better coming out and coming back in again, maybe, and see if it's better. Or I, can everyone hear me? Hello, that sounded a bit better. Let's have another go. Okay, great. All right, let's try this again. Um, uh, this has been a very long 15 months, and I cannot emphasize how tired everyone is, but you know. I think as we see the light um, coming at the end of the tunnel with the vaccines, we cannot let go up off the, the gas, off the brakes actually too early. And we're seeing that in many countries, people are relaxing way too soon. People are ignoring a lot of the precautions all while we are actually trying to get to the end. And the variants, I've been trying to raise my voice about P1. So Thomas, thank you for your paper. It is one of the most uh, well-read paper. I've been reading your preprints and um, the, the, also the coverage internationally on P1 because there's so little data. Uh, in, in certain ways, B117 has a lot of sequencing in the UK, a lot of sequencing in Denmark and Europe, and it has a shortcut PCR test. Unfortunately, um, P the shortcut PCR test is not widely available. It exists, but it's not widely available. And so we, and it's incurring in a country that has very limited genome sequencing. So it is so critical that we understand this. And now that we see that it is about 2X more transmissible than the old, old uh, strain, which makes it faster than even B117 from, from UK, Kent, that means it could potentially replace it. And this is why we have to be really careful and vigilant about the spread in containing P1 as much as possible. And one of the one places that it had gotten out of control was uh, Vancouver in British Columbia, Canada. 
and the epidemic in British Columbia, Canada has just been utterly insane. It's been growing and outpacing B117 by leaps and bounds, and it also infected the Vancouver Canucks uh, NHL hockey team uh, and took down most of the team, uh, infected most of the team, and many of the these super athletic professional athletes were actually sickened and were on IV fluids. That's how severe uh, of a problem the P1 is. And as we know, um, reinfection is a risk. And I think in certain ways, there are a lot of people who don't want to talk about vaccines and variants. This is an ongoing problem. Vaccines definitely work. They will still work against almost all variants. And to some degree, they will work to slow down variants. But we cannot be complacent. We cannot lie to ourselves that is 100% perfect. And there are those out there who are trying to argue that we have vaccines. Vaccines are coming. They're rolling out. Just wait your turn. But, you know, don't worry about the variants. And I don't, and I don't think that is a good idea because we know that the South Africa variant, B1351, uh, AstraZeneca vaccine is low efficacy for mild and moderate. That is well proven. New England Journal published. Uh, um, and South Africa Ministry of Health has, uh, has paused AstraZeneca there because of its lack of good efficacy against B1351. And uh, we see the breakthroughs in that Israel study. The matched case control found eight times higher likelihood of breakthrough with uh, the South African variant against Pfizer. A double a vaccine advisor. And also, you know, B117, a lot of people say, yes, the vaccine does work. I agree. But for partially va uh, vaccinated, one dose AstraZeneca, um, and actually one dose Pfizer also against the B117, the efficacy was, was much lower. And there was actually breakthrough also found in the Israel study with just one dose against B117. Two doses, not much. And of course, B117 asymptomatic transmission, the efficacy in our Lancet paper was uh, for the AstraZeneca vaccine and B117 asymptomatic cases was 29%. And it was not statistically significant. So that puts it on par with, um, and that's two dose uh, AstraZeneca. And that puts it on par with basically uh, the South Africa variant in terms of B117 asymptomatic. And we need to be realistic you know, realism and precautionary principle is so key. And it's the lack of precautionary principle last year that got us in, in the whole mess. You know, at first he said, well, there's no evidence of human to human transmission. Well, no evidence doesn't mean that there is actually none. Clearly there's human transmission. Oh, asymptomatic transmission, that doesn't happen. We didn't see it with the old SARS. Well, it happens. It's 30 to 50% of all transmission. And then airborne, it's not really airborne. It is very much airborne. Had we taken the precautionary principle and then, you know, and over time lifted some of the restrictions if it was disproven, if we took that approach, we would have been, we would be in a much better place than we are now. And right now with the variants, true, we don't know how all the variants act against uh, the vaccines, but we cannot pretend the vaccines are, are totally fine against the variants. Because we see in the neutralization studies that even in the Pfizer and Moderna, supposedly the, the mRNA, the, the better mRNA vaccine, some people claim, um, the South Africa variant has, you know, Moderna has 20-fold lower reduced neutralization. Pfizer has 30 to 40x lower uh, fold neutralization on par with uh, unrelated um, back coronavirus. Um, and also for P1, it's four and a half X lower neutralization for double vaccinated Pfizer, uh, Moderna, and six and a half at full lower neutralization for double vaccinated Pfizer against P1, the Brazilian. So as Thomas uh, pointed out, there is some reinfection risk. This is also supported by some of the neutralization studies and of course uh, our experience in Manaus. So altogether, we know that this is a potential looming issue. Now, a lot of people don't want to talk about it, but here is why we need to protect our borders. Some people say, well, you know, border cases, it's just going to be like a handful or maybe a dozen at most a day compared to hundreds of thousands or thousands of cases in our country every day. Why do we even need to bother with border? Two, two answers. First of all, 
if you have near zero, like Israel does, and UK is actually getting really close, uh, or but uh, you know zero COVID countries like New Zealand, Australia, they need border controls to protect their zero, right? And second of all, the variants. We know that P1 is a serious problem. It's a serious menace to Brazil, and we can't kid ourselves that somehow Brazilians are different than, than North Americans and Europe, uh, Western Europeans are going to be totally fine against P1. The data is just simply is not there. P1 is going to be a menace. And the South Africa uh, variant, we know it's a, is already, it's the worst neutralization study, uh, neutral, worst, worst neutralization variant. And the new Indian um, B1617, as well as B1618, are quickly ri rising. The, the the latest B1618 was, um, uh, is, is now the third leading variant. Uh, in, so there's two India variants. And they're quickly replacing uh, all the old, old strains. And, and 1617 is outpacing um, you know, B117 in India as well. So altogether, we cannot let these variants come in. Even though we don't know exactly what the behavior of the uh, 1617 is knowing the mutation that it has that it has the uh, e e e4a4k mutation that uh, that uh, South Africa uh, variant does we should take the precautionary principle and really take strong look at border controls and border controls I mean not just relying on 72 hour prior departure testing we also need pre um, pre boarding uh, rapid testing and post uh, so long haul flights uh, disembarkation deboarding tests, as well as hotel quarantine. And the, the India Hong Kong uh, testing clearly shows that 47 cases of those uh, found on this one single flight from India, from Delhi, uh, only eight were found upon uh, deboarding. Um, most of them, including 22 of the 47 cases, were found on day 12 of the hotel quarantine. And that just shows you it's a serious risk. And on almost every single flight uh, from uh, from uh, from India to Toronto this past month, um, there have been a, a cases identified. So we need to be really vigilant. We need to rethink about strictness of border controls and imply uh, in putting in mandatory hotel quarantines, especially for high risk countries that there are new variants that your, the current country does not really have many of. And um, and I'll you know. I'll move, uh, relinquish my time here, and I've spoken a lot, but I think these are really vigilant. It's the lack of vigilance, the lack of precautionary principle that allowed us to get here in the first place. And that's why I try to communicate as loud as I can and get people's attention, because we cannot be complacent. Uh, that's very clear. Thanks. Thanks very much, Eric, for that. That was a, a third force around the, vari the, the grim world of variants. Um, an interesting question we've had asked is uh, from Nessa Childers, and uh, she was asking about the variants, of course, but she also said, uh, what strategy should we be using to protect uh, our vulnerable patients in, in healthcare? Because she's a healthcare worker and she's had uh, one shot of uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine. But if you were trying to protect patients and healthcare workers, what vaccine strategy would you use? And could I just add, add another topical one? And that is uh, the UK, as you know, has delayed second dose uh, uh, up to, for up to three months. And that's under consideration, I know, in Ireland. Do you have a view on that? So those two questions. What, what would you do to use vaccines best to protect patients and healthcare workers? And then secondly, what do you think about um, uh, the interval between doses? Mm -hmm. And I think there's, I want to point out that only AstraZeneca vaccine has good interval data on long-term intervals. There's, there's one study that's been published now that shows a longer interval is okay. The efficacy could actually improve with 12 weeks or more. But the reality of that is, although the total efficacy you achieve is a little bit higher with 12 weeks delay, according to the study, the, in the interim time, the 12 weeks, the protection is less than perfect. And, and I want to point out that remember, B117, the vaccine is good against B117 if double vaccinated. Uh, against a, a single dose, uh, we see the breakthrough of, uh, in, the, in the same Israeli study that found the, the 8x higher uh, breakthrough uh, comparative rate for the South Africa strain. Um, we found that there's 2.6 fold higher breakthrough 
for one dose of vaccine against B117. So we know that with single dose, it's less than perfect. That, that gap closed once you had two doses. So this is why faster, more vaccination so that people can get two doses is also really key because 12 weeks is a long time in pandemic time world that we in which we live. It's it, literally surges can start from scratch when there are uh, a few to be had previously in the 12 week period. And so it's a difficult choice. I don't empathize it uh, in making that difficult choice, but this is why vaccine rollout and the speed so we can get it uh, to as many people as possible is really critical. And I want to also remind, even with two doses, asymptomatic B117 is 29% for AstraZeneca vaccine. This is why we cannot let people think that, oh, I've been vaccinated. I can uh, release all my uh, you know, precautionary uh, principles into the wind because that is just not true. You need to continue masking because the, the, clearly the efficacy for mild and asymptomatic cases is not near 95% at all. And so uh, it's, it's something we have to stay vigilant about. So like, what, what about healthcare workers and vaccines? Do you have a particular view on that? Well, I think healthcare workers should get vaccinated, of course, but they should still wear N95 masks, still have really good ventilation. Um, face shields, I guess, uh, is it would be precautionary, but at the same time, we know that if face shields was, if the virus wasn't airborne, face shields would protect you, uh, but the virus is airborne and face shields, you know, overall is is not the solution. We we have to take uh, this Swiss cheese approach as uh, as one uh, uh, researcher once said, it, we have to layer them. We cannot rely on one single barrier wall. It, it's like we need to multi-layered castle defense strategy. We need a moat. We need a drawbridge. We need several layers of walls, and we, and we need progressively more locks and um, and trap doors to keep the virus out. Sure, I, I agree. I mean, I think one of the one of the terrible things that's happened is sometimes politicians, in particular, have, have, have looked for a silver bullet and then claim to have found it, and right. they they dismiss everything else. And uh, public health is always a mixture of measures are required. And um, could I take advantage of you as a uh, as a, a, a guest from the US, and um, as, uh, as everyone on is very well aware, you have a, an Irish-American president uh, who's been in power for a while and has taken a really different course with COVID-19. How do you think Joe Biden's doing? Well, I think the Biden administration has uh, tried to under-promise and over-deliver um, these you know, 100 million vaccine shots in 100 days. We're now uh, about to break 200 million, and in the million shots in the first 100 days. Um, we've ordered more vaccines than the Trump administration and also more, more importantly, exportable va vaccines. Because in the Trump administration, the Operation Warp Speed contracts were that none of the ordered vaccines may be used outside of US territories. It was basically one of those non-exportable vaccine contracts that Trump, but Joe Biden contracts, I don't think have them uh, at all. They're trying to ramp up. They're forcing Merck to produce uh, other vaccines um, to basically collaborate with uh, uh, the other uh, Pfizer vaccines and Moderna. And they're trying to ramp up Johnson & Johnson. And I think the U.S. is trying to actually create like a Serum Institute of India um, production so that it can actually provide vaccines for the world and not just rely on India to produce uh, most of the world's vaccines. And of course, the COVAX, joining COVAX and donating billions to COVAX is a, is a great step. Um, I think right now, U.S. needs to be able to share. And everyone's asking U.S. to share. But I want to point out, U.S., the current stock of vaccines the U.S. has currently administering is the Trump order batch. The Biden ordered batch of uh, vaccines without the, the no export rule is coming in May. So starting in May, the vaccines... Th uh, that we will be receiving will be able to be donated more. So expect that we, uh, the U.S. donation vaccines will increase as soon as uh, those Biden ordered batch vaccines that can be exported outside the U.S. arrive. Good. Th thank you very much for that. Um, right. Let's have um, 
some more general questions and maybe some questions about Ireland now and uh, put it open to the, the panel as well as our guests to, to chip in. And uh, the, the first one is uh, from Aoife O'Brien, who wants to know how likely it is that P1 and uh, B1351 begin circulating widely in Ireland. What will the consequence be in Ireland if the variants become dominant over our, our current uh, strain? And what are the and are the numbers of these variants in the country at this point? Is the number concerning? Would anyone like on the panel like to pick that up? Thomas. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can have a go, perhaps. Um, so I, I would just say uh, I think we've seen that there was twenty four. Uh, cases of P1 uh, picked up. I mean, th that number is extremely worrying. Really, you want to keep that at absolutely at zero. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what the, the under ascertainment level is in Ireland, um, what the genome sampling is like, but uh, it seems unlikely that there wouldn't be community transmission if you're picking up 24, unless you have a very good uh, quarantine system and you're picking up a lot of imports. Um, so, I mean, and just another point, you know, I think we have to be, I mean, as Eric said, we have to be wary against sort of uh, exceptionalism here in Europe and the US. We've seen what's happened in Brazil. There's no reason to think that there can't be uh, similar uh, issues here. Of course, Ireland's different. It has B117. Now, whether or not P1 can become dominant over B117 is an open question. We have to wait to see. Um, it's, okay. it's very serious for sure. Thank you. Jerry Clean, would you like to come in on this one? Yeah, I, uh, I would say that I think P1 is still underdiagnosed because um, unlike, you know, B117, oftentimes you have the, the, the S gene dropout shortcut test, which is very popular and widely available. And that's actually how we know that B117, how, how fast it transmits and how severe, it's 16% more severe. Um, but for these other P1, we don't have a shortcut test that clues you in, ah, this could be a variant we should test for. They do exist, but in a more academia laboratory setting, and it's not widely available. And so that's, so there's this under detection. I think in many ways, uh, it's already here. So B1351 is also surging, by the way, in the UK, if, you, if, you, if you've seen the latest data. Uh, B1351 and P1 are also surging in France. Um, this, they're, they're not like single digit percentage of variants anymore. I have to check the latest numbers, but they're, they are not rare. Um, and I think the reinfection potential of them also, uh, suggests that people who were previously infected should not feel that they have true immunity. A vaccine immunity also is likely better than a natural infection immunity, but you know, I don't think the vaccine will not work. I think it's just much lower. Like, for example, uh, Johnson & Johnson, Novavax, the, um, the efficacy was about 50 to 60% against the South Africa strain, much lower than Novavax, 91%, uh, you know, for non-South Africa. So we know that there is a disparity. Now, 50% back in last fall, any of us would have taken a 50% uh, efficacy vaccine in a heartbeat when there were none. But we just have to be cognizant that a 50% efficacy against one of these strains, for example, the South African, I, we don't know the efficacy for the P1 precisely, is, is much of a leakier system. And it's, we have to think of leakier systems in which the, yeah. by itself, it is not enough. That's why we need premium masks. We need to double mask. We need the border quarantines. We need more mass testing. We need to, mass testing with rapid antigen tests are not perfect, and some people cite that imperfection as a reason not to do it. No, you think of it like raking your leaves in your lawn. The rake will pick up most of the big pieces of leaves. And in certain ways, that is what we need to do. And if you rake several times, we know that actually rapid antigen testing from various models, uh, Dr. Michael Mina is the best expert in this, if you rake it several times, you can actually stop the transmission because the multi-rake system uh, will allow you to get rid of most of the cases. And we need all of them, all of them together. And the, and the, more, uh, the lower the efficacy there is against the variant, 
the more vigilant we have to be on the other dimensions. And we always play whack-a-mole, as we call it in America. We try to do one thing but forget the other. And, and eventually this uh, problem keeps cropping up from different dimensions. And we have this roller coaster in which the roller coaster never actually hits bottom but ends up in a plateau. And then we give up politically and then we surge again. I think the lack of political willpower to go to zero is, is, is very lacking. And the political willpower to say, you know, if I have high cholesterol and I go on a vegan diet, well, you know, I can go on a vegan diet for a month uh, and my cholesterol and blood pressure will go down. But if I switch back to eating bacon and sausages, there is no universe in which uh, even if you, after you eat vegan, you're all of a sudden not going to have cholesterol surges, right? Because unless you get to zero, unless you solve the underlying disease, you're uh, going back to what we did before will always cause a surge again. So that's why we have to try to go to zero as much as we can, especially in wealthier countries. India, I'm not sure if it can go to zero, but Ireland, being an island, I think it can try to strive for zero like New Zealand and Australia has, and it has the wealth enough to protect that zero with a bubble um, that with good leadership for a, uh, for a country like Ireland should be very feasible. Yeah, sure. And, and uh, Eric, I don't know if you know, but we were practically at zero last summer. We had it within within our grasp, but we, it, we let it slip away. Very unfortunate. And unfortunate is a very polite word for it. Uh, Jerry, Colleen, would you like to come in on this question? Sure. Thanks, Gabriel. Yeah. And, and, and also, you know, echoing a question by, by William Syme here about you know, what do we know about things like B1617? I think that's a great variant to bring up because the short answer is very, very little. Um, and there's lots of uncertainty. But I've been through a, a few pandemics and and there's different ways we manage different risks. So you manage regular risks in a regular way. There's, there's steady risks, they're fixed, you can estimate them. But then there are risks that come from evolution and that are potentially catastrophic and where you can't get the genie back in the bottle. So you manage those in very different ways. So you, you manage them in a preemptive way rather than a reactive way, and you, you really apply the precautionary principle. And that's what we need to do with, um, with variants. You know, my own, I remember one of the, kind of the first two pandemics I lived with, one of them was um, basically malaria became almost an untreatable disease in Africa and the drugs that you walked around with in your pocket, um, if you needed to use them, you knew you had about a 50% chance that they would work. Now, WHO did the right thing back in those days, 20 years ago. They implemented a policy of combination therapy only, which would be equivalent to our second generation of vaccines that are on their way for COVID. Uh, but in the meantime, we do have to take that preemptive approach to managing variants rather than reactive. And certainly here in the Republic, you know, I'm really concerned that our, our approach is reactive. And we already have a lot of these variants in the country. We need to react to deal with those, but we also need to change our policy generally so that, you know, we don't get to the stage where, um, you know, it may be too late to react. Great. Thanks very much, Jerry. Um, Another question from Eva O'Brien, should the Indian variants be added to the list of variants of concern in Ireland and do we need mandatory hotel quarantine for people coming from the UK? I wonder, does that mean between Nuri and Dundalk? Um, uh, but a good question, uh, and, and because uh, the UK has put, uh, including Northern Ireland, has put India on its red list in four days time, which is, this is the daftest thing, talk about what the shutting Stable door when the horse is bolted. And here you are leaving it open for four days to be published. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a, but but and, and you can guarantee that the planes will be full uh, from India. The many direct flights that there are, and you could be guaranteeing that some of those people will be will be coming to Ireland, north or south, along the way. Um, and it's just an interesting question in terms of the whole approach to to quarantine and the identification of places. Would anyone like Aoife, who uh, wasn't able to be here to chair today, but uh, yeah. here, here she is. That's because I, I need to leave in one minute, so I'll, uh, I'll speak now while I can. But I just think um, I can give a broad answer to this question. I think it's just, uh, it's a very 
pertinent question. It gets right to the heart of, you know, what is the purpose of doing the hotel quarantine? What is the purpose of, of doing this at all? So, um, and as we were discussing last week with Nal Connery as well, you can, you can use it to try and protect your status if you've achieved zero, like they have in Australia and New Zealand. And you can also use it to try and keep the variants out. And um, there's no, we know these things move so quickly. And um, Thomas said earlier how Manaus is not a particularly well-connected part of the world, yet the variant that originated in Manaus has, Manaus has now spread um, throughout the world. You know, it's, it's in all kinds of different countries. And so if we're trying to keep variants out, we need to have a comprehensive uh, hotel quarantine system. Otherwise, we will be just um, reacting after the fact. We'll be creating a much more complex situation for ourselves. We don't yet know, as far as I understand it, we don't yet know whether or not the variant in India is actually more infectious or more dangerous in any way. But as Christina Pago pointed out during the week, the way we find that out is by watching and seeing it overcome health systems and watching and seeing how badly it uh, affects people. So the only way to learn is to let things get worse and we shouldn't let that happen. So as Eric said, we should apply the precautionary principle. Either this, uh, this variant is as this equal to the one we already have or it's worse. Either way, we should be um, protecting ourselves and keeping it out. So we need to be have a comprehensive quarantine system to protect the gains we have made in the country and to avoid letting things get worse potentially. Thanks, thanks very much. Uh, uh, Thomas, uh, Thomas Mellon, could, would you like to comment from, a, from your kind of perspective about uh, keeping the variants out and, and this issue of uh, flights from India just at the moment and, and where, when quarantine should be started and, and where it should extend to? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I, I would just like to comment uh, on the precautionary principle. So I'm most familiar with fitting the kind of statistical models that are used to determine what are the properties of these variants. Do they have incorrect transmissibility? For example, B117, B1351, P1. Um, and uh, Aoife made a very good point that the, the problem is we have to wait for the data to arise and enable uh, in order to be able to estimate using statistical models what the epidemiology epidemiological characteristics of these variants are and of course uh, by the time you've classified something as a variant of concern it's already doing a great deal of damage somewhere so this is this is almost too late um yeah i mean an, an important point i think to make about flights coming in from countries where there's variants is something we have to look out for is potentially so we know about changes in the disease whether it's increases in transmissibility potentially increases in the ages it affects uh, increases uh, changes in cross immunity but something to look out for is potentially changes in the length of the disease so changes in the generation interval longer periods of latency and this is something that could potentially scupper plans for quarantine perhaps you're quarantining for 10 days, that might not necessarily be enough. You could still be infectious after a slightly longer period. So I'm just saying that's something to keep under review in terms of quarantining people flying in from countries with variants. Yeah, and I wonder, does anyone know if there is any knowledge about the variants and long COVID? It's probably too early now and the numbers are too small to, um, to have that. Is there anything about P1 that you know of, Thomas, about long COVID and P1? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, it's so Still recent. Uh, yeah. yeah. Good. Uh, Jerry, you wanted to come in again briefly? Yeah, just very briefly, because I was involved in a discussion similar to this um, about a year ago relating to how we manage insecticide resistance variants in mosquitoes. And basically what we made the point is that you always get most of your evidence from the places that have had the worst outcomes. And it basically becomes, you know, we coined the term um, post-mortem epidemiology, you know, you're very sure that you should have done something, but, you know, something different earlier. Okay. Thank you. Um, one of the questions that we've had is about, about children and variants and whether there is um, any evidence of them acting differently, behaving differently with regards to children in terms of infectivity and also seriousness of illness. Uh, do, do any of our panelists or our guests have anything to um, to contribute on that issue? Yeah, um, 
about the children, this is a very common asked question. And there is evidence that B117 infects children more than the old strain. And I want to make sure it's not that children are infected more than adults. It's not that. It's just previously children were less um, infected than adults with the old strain. But now children, are, although the more B117 is more contagious, the contagiousness rises more for children relative to the old strain than the adults rise. And we've seen this is a, it's about 25% higher risk for younger children. And it's about like teen, upper teens percent for uh, older children. And this is the work of Sarah Rasmussen from um, University of Cambridge. And uh, it's also, this is the paper that uh, Angela Merkel also cited, as well as Michael Osterholm, Biden uh, uh, COVID uh, uh, advisor cited as well. Um, and because of this, uh, we think it's because of the higher viral load. So other data on long COVID, B117 yields a higher viral load. And so hence it can affect uh, children a little uh, more efficiently. And also, by the way, B117 increases duration in which you're infectious. That was another paper that's out there. And so with that consideration is maybe do we need to extend the quarantine? Because previously we know that there were a percentage of people who would be the incubation time, the time from your infection to showing symptoms was longer than 14 days. Previously, it was like one in a hundred, um, and some found it like a little bit higher, but but now that we find that B117 has a broader infectious period, acute infectious period than the previous strain, which was shorter number of days, we may have to think about if this is broader, um, and again, if it infects children more, should we take, again, more precautions? And just yesterday in Germany, the latest data shows that you know, although elderly cases are protected, of all the non-elderly uh, uh, age groups, children age 15 to 19 were the most highly infected, like per capita rate was the highest incidence in this age group. And the children five to 14, it's the highest rate yet to date in those age groups so far, you know, higher than previous, even the previous epidemic. Um, and, and in Brazil, there's, um, there's a study in Piranha, Brazil, in which in January, it wasn't a P1-affected area. P1 was still restricted in Manaus. But by late February and March, they actually found that the case fatality ratio, the CFR, again, very short period, so we're not talking about long other confounders, within one month had doubled among middle age, but tripled among young people, age 20 to 29. We don't know anything about pediatric. But the CFR, within literally a span of one and a half months, had tripled in 2029 and doubled in other populations. And there is evidence that it could be the P, uh, P1 is more severe, but also maybe um, the cases, it's P1 is affecting younger children. And we're seeing a lot of that in hospitalization. And so welcome, Thomas, if he's seen more data on that. But it's, it's widely reported that ICU patients are getting about 10 years younger than last year in Brazil. Thank you very much, Eric. And I think the time has come to draw this to a halt for today. Um, and I'd just like to particularly thank our, our two guests, Eric uh, Feigl Ding and Thomas Mallon for their fantastic contributions and for being so generous with their time and answering uh, our questions. Uh, thanks also to the panelists who have joined us and thank you for listening in. Um, we hold these open meetings once a week, every Wednesday, and you're very welcome to come back and tell others who'd like to come back. And we welcome your questions if you'd like to send them in to ISAG in any way you like. Uh, we, we want to help you understand COVID-19 and what we need to do uh, to get uh, the virus eliminated in Ireland. And uh, your help and assistance in doing that would be, and engagement would be very much appreciated. So thank you very much. I hope you have uh, uh, a good rest of the week and take care of yourselves. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.